really right now, but I was a mess. And um, as he approached that deer, the baby got, it was just a little baby fawn, got up and fell, got up again and fell, then got up and took off into the woods. Mm -hmm. So he said, well, he's fine. I said, he could have collapsed right inside the woods. You've got to go in there. So he went in there and he said, he's gone. So Good. yeah, I think it was okay. All right. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to go ahead and start our conversation for tonight. Um, so uh, just first of all, welcome to everybody who is able to be here with us live and anyone who's watching on YouTube. Um, it's, a, 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 it's great to have you here. Great to be able to host you. Uh, my name is Christian Wynn, and I'm the uh, teaching minister at Colonial Church. Um, and this is the Faith and Humanities Forum. Um, the sort of the genesis and background of the Faith and Humanities Forum um, in part had to do, I think, with the fact that higher education has been going through quite a bit of upheaval, and we've watched um, a lot of humanities programs uh, actually disappear from certain university settings. Um, but uh, if you know something about sort of the history of the humanities, um, broadly conceived, you know that some of that uh, conversation, some of those disciplines are very much rooted in the life of the church. And so we've created this forum in part to sort of reclaim some of that and to invite people who are doing work in different humanistic disciplines to come in and share their work um, and, uh, and maybe to, to force us, uh, to provoke us to contemplate the ways that that work intersects with faith, uh, the life of faith. And uh, so tonight I am uh, super happy uh, to um, introduce to you uh, someone that I consider a, a dear, dear friend, um, Bruce Herman. I, I can, before I sort of get into the details uh, of, of, of kind of Bruce, where, who Bruce is and where he's from, um, I, I lived with Bruce uh, and his wife, Meg, um, and Sarah. I think she was 15 or 16. I was a seminary student. And um, they took in a few boarders during the summer of uh, seminarians and allowed us to live there. Um, and just their house became a kind of space where I figured, I, I kind of learned what Christian community could actually look like. Um, uh, I was, I, I will say that uh, I was not always, uh, um, I don't know if I lived up to some of my obligations. I'm not sure I did enough work around the house. I think that was always a question. Was I pulling my load? Uh, so I, I'm trying to do that better now, Bruce. I just want you to know, I'm trying to grow into that, uh, uh, even in my own house. So it's, it's continued to be a challenge, but anyway, <laughs> uh, so Bruce is, uh, you know, aside from just being a wonderful human being, uh, he is really a well-known artist, um, around the world. He has, um, had exhibitions, um, uh, both nationally in Boston, New York, and LA, and several other major cities in the US, um, but also uh, has had his work displayed and has had exhibitions in Italy, England, Israel, Japan, and Hong Kong. Um, and uh, so he's actually quite well known uh, in the art world, and particularly in, I think, the art world, the, the sort of what we might call the Christian art world, um, uh, I guess uh, I'll let Bruce sort of define what that might look like. So the person who comes to us tonight to speak is, um, has a real he a heft and I think depth to, uh, to himself and to his work. Um, the seriousness which was, with which he's always approached it um, was something that also I think inspired me as a young man um, when I was uh, able to share that time uh, with, his, with he and his family. So tonight he's going to be talking to us on the topic art and voluntary exile. And so I am going to mute myself and shut up and turn it over to you, Bruce. So welcome, my friend. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, everybody might, it might be good if everybody mutes just because it's, it's a little easier. When we, thanks. That's great. Okay, so I'm just going to go ahead and screen share right away, um, if I can find it, here we go. Okay. 
Perfect. Okay, my, uh, as Christian said, I'm a very serious artist. So I thought it was important to start on a serious note. Look at that kid's snowman. What a pathetic cliche. Am I supposed to identify with this complacent moron and his shovel? This snowman says nothing about the human condition. Is this all the kid has to say about contemporary suburban life? The soulless banality of this snowman is a sad comment on today's art world. Now, come and look at my snowman. I call it the torment of existence weighed against the horror of non-being. As he melts, the sculpture will become even more poignant. I admire your willingness to put artistic integrity before marketability. This kid uh, suddenly got insight as to what was important in, in, the, in art. But I mean, what, what, this is my full title tonight, which I'll talk about a little bit and hopefully it'll come clear as I go. You catastrophe to Eucharist, art as voluntary exile. And uh, those terms may be familiar to you, but if they're not, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about it a little bit, but I'm gonna start with a quote from a medieval uh, mystic and Christian churchman and founder of the, the, uh, the school of St. Victor in Paris. He is weak or she is weak for whom her native land remains sweet. He is strong for whom every land is as a homeland. He is perfect for whom the whole world is as a place of exile. This is from the Didascalicon, which is Hugh of St. Victor's defense of the liberal arts, of the humanities, of studying history, poetry, theology, philosophy, um, literature. So why would he say, and, and, and what might this pithy quote here have to do with the humanities, and specifically to this series that Christian Wynne and the colonial church have been trying to promote of faith and the humanities. Well, uh, just on the face of it, Hugh is, there's a progression going on here. From weakness to strength to a, a certain kind of completeness or perfection. He is weak for whom his native land is sweet. In other words, when your identity is so totally tied to the things you already know, and the people you feel comfortable with, it weakens you actually. And it actually is, it's, a, it's a sign of strength when you become capable of identifying with, with almost anybody and living almost anywhere and treating almost any place as your homeland. So that's a form of strength, a kind of willingness to identify with others and to connect with others uh, rather than just stay in your little safety zone. But this last one is a curveball. He is perfect. He is complete for whom the whole world is as a place of exile. Now, the first thing that comes to my mind, I don't know about you, um, if you're a, a Christian believer, you've, you're familiar with this, this passage in the scriptures where Jesus says, birds have nests, foxes have holes in the ground, but the son of man has nowhere to place his head, to lay his head. He's spiritually homeless in this world. In other words, he lives in voluntary exile. And he invites those who follow him, the students of Jesus, to let go of their tight identity with their homeland, with their, even with their own family. In another place, he says, he who uh, loves his family more than me is not worthy of me. So there's a sense of letting go, always letting go, and then finally, and identifying with others, and then finally achieving this this kind of spiritual or, or worldly homelessness in which you actually are at home everywhere. Now, what the heck does this have to do with studying the liberal arts? Well, if you think about it just for a minute or two, you'll get it. 
by, by studying literature, specifically literature of other countries, other people, um, you begin to see, oh, you know what? Those Italians, they really have some insights. In fact, I'm thinking I'm gonna go to Italy <laughs> or the Chinese. I mean, you read the, the words of Confucius or Lao Tzu and there's wisdom there. You start to realize, wow, these other cultures, it's not just, you know, St. Paul or Minneapolis. You know, it's not just Boston that is a good place, but there, but then this curveball, this, this strange twist at the end, which is if you really want to get closer to the truth and develop wisdom and, and real knowledge, you will become a spiritual exile. Because why? You're following the incarnate truth. truth. I am the way, I'm the path, I'm the truth, I'm the life, Jesus said. And if you follow me, you're gonna to have to pick up a cross. Not only will you become like me, not no place to lay your head, but you will suffer. So he says, count the cost. Count the cost if you're going to, um, you know, if you're going to uh, follow me. So he is weak for whom his native land remains sweet. He is strong for whom every land is as a homeland and he is perfect for whom the whole world is as a place of exile. There's a progression there, like I said. So let's see if I can get this to go forward. There we go. Now, here's another quote I want you to interact with. Uh, let me, before I go forward, Christian, could you unmute yourself for a second and just tell me, can you read all those words on the screen? Yeah, I can see all those. You mean, uh, you mean read them for you now? Okay. Yeah, no, no, I was just saying, can you, can you see them all? Yep. Yep. Okay. Yeah, I, I couldn't see them all because I, a moment ago, I saw all, all these faces covering the screen, but I, I'm glad you can see it. That's all that matters. Yeah. We no longer dare to believe in beauty and we make of it a mere appearance in order the more easily to dispose of it. Our situation today shows that beauty demands for itself at least as much courage and decision as do truth and goodness. And she, beauty, will not allow herself to be separated and banned from her two sisters, goodness and truth, without taking them along with herself in an act of mysterious vengeance. We can be sure that whoever sneers at beauty as if she were the ornament of a bourgeois past, whether he admits it or not, can no longer pray and soon will no longer be able to love. So, we no longer dare to believe in beauty and we make it a mere appearance in order more easily to dispose of it. It demands courage, decision, the same way that truth and goodness do. So what, what is this beauty that he's talking about? Well, um, let's keep thinking about beauty a little bit here because we're gonna come back to Hugh of St. Victor's statement about voluntary exile and that the, perf the perfection of this process of learning and attaining wisdom leads to a kind of ability to identify with everyone in every place, but also a kind of exile. But let's dwell on beauty a little bit here. So von Balthasar says it requires as much courage and decision as do truth and goodness. But here another voice, a familiar voice from John Keats in his poem, Ode on a Grecian Urn, beauty is truth and truth beauty. And yet, Beauty is not something you can just take in very simply. It's not contained. It's certainly not circumscribed by what is pretty. Think about it for a minute. No one would dispute that what can be seen through the Hubble telescope is beautiful. It's beautiful, it's stunningly beautiful. But if you stop to think about what we're actually looking at here, this is the Crab Nebula. It's about 170,000 light years across. A light year is what it takes light traveling at the speed of light, 186,000 miles per second. It takes it a year, that's a light year. So 172,000 light years across. And what is this beautiful shape? It's, it's, it's clouds of hot gases and, and dust that have been superheated 
to unimaginable violence. These are stars being born. This is the, this is the womb of stars. And the fury and the violence of the forces at play in the birth of a star and of a galaxy and of a, of a nebula are unimaginable. Our own sun, which is an average sized star, is so hot and the action that's taking place on the surface of the sun so intense that if we got just a little bit closer, if our planet just got a little too close, it would burn up our entire atmosphere and everything on earth would die. So that, just put that in context. What is beauty? Or something other familiar site, the Grand Canyon, which no one would dispute is beautiful, but think about what created that canyon. The force of water at such a velocity and such a massive volume that it carved rock over millennia. Again, we get caught in a little flood, a little tsunami comes in or a, a, you know, a flood down in Louisiana and destroys, destroys New Orleans. But that compared to the forces at play that carved the Grand Canyon is nothing. So, you know, and, and another, a cyclone seen from outer space from the space station, incredibly beautiful, but violent, wrecking havoc. So, you know, what are we talking about here? Beauty is truth and truth, beauty, yet beauty is not straightforward. So what does this have to do with what we're talking about? Well, let's, let's start with Emily Dickinson, a familiar poem. Tell all the truth, but tell it slant. Success in circuit lies, too bright for our infirm delight, the truth's superb surprise. As lightning to the children eased, with explanation kind, the truth must dazzle gradually, or every man be blind. So what is the job of the artist? Well, Emily Dickinson says, tell it slant, make it like lightning, lightning eased to the children, lest every man become blind. Don't, don't clobber people with it. But it does require a level of truthfulness that might involve something, that involves something like what created the Grand Canyon or the, the Crab Nebula or those incredible weather systems that we were looking at. They may, sometimes artists have to take beauty and break it open in order to make it in their work. Consequently, artists are sometimes strangers and difficult people. Uh, that's where the stereotype of the artist has come from. It's come from a, a certain level of truth, which is artists can upset us. They can disrupt our comfort zone. They can present to us concepts like a violent beauty, a violent grace. But here's the question I wanna dwell on here. So back to Hugh of St. Victor for a moment, if you're following what I was saying, trying to unpack that pithy statement of his. By studying the arts, by studying literature and history and philosophy and theology and the customs of other cultures and the wisdom and, and arts of other cultures, it loosens your tight grip on your own identity, your nice little parochial comfort, comfort zone and exposes you to eventually something rather dramatic. Like Jesus said, you know, if you follow me, count the cost. You're gonna end up like me crucified. Not very inviting. You know, on one level, you can say, wow, why do we have to, if we're going to follow Jesus, why is it going to be so costly and so difficult? Well, what I'm trying to say here is that as an artist, we need to invite the artists in. We have to, we have to invite them in. And I'm going to give you a little image to, to, to sort of hang your, your, that thought on for a moment. Not many people know this, but the word symbol, a word that we use all the time to mean, you know, some kind of a sign or, or a, an image or a phrase that uh, kind of gathers in multiple levels of meaning and, and can symbolize, in other words, make a kind of rich textured and layered kind of meaning for us. The original meaning of the word, which is a Greek, comes from the Greek symbolon, was this little tile now, what you're seeing on the screen is something about the size of your thumb. And the front side of it is a handshake and the back side says Tessera Hospitalis. And then the name of the person who owned this. And what a symbol was in ancient Greek culture was this little tile, 
it was a ceramic tile. And when a person came to your house for the first time and you were inviting them in, probably a stranger, before they crossed the threshold into your house to be given hospitality, you took this little tile, probably out of a bowl of little tiles like this, and you broke it in half and gave them half. And then you would say something like this, henceforth you and anyone with whom you share this piece of tile is welcome in my home. Only the two pieces must be fitted together again. That's what a symbol was. It was literally a tessera hospitalis, a tile of welcome. And so the word symbol has come to mean metaphorically the act of kind of welcoming other people into your intellectual, artistic, literary, cultural realm, your, your home as it were, and allowing them to participate in the meaning, the shared meaning that's possible when there's something broken like that. When Jesus broke the bread at his table and said, this is my body broken for you, what he was doing was he was welcoming us to the table of God. He was welcoming us across the threshold into the realm of holiness and the mystery of God's presence. So where am I going with this? Well, this symbol, this deeply meaningful, layered, textured kind of meaningful thing that we talk about was originally just a little tile of welcome, and but it involved a breaking. Just keep that in mind because we're gonna come back to it. So art and intellectual hospitality is a kind of exile welcome. In other words, you're being welcomed to participate like Jesus was welcoming us to the table by allowing himself to be broken on the cross and then symbolically en enacting that the day before, the night before, when he said, this is my body broken for you. Take and eat this, drink this, this wine, which is my blood of the new covenant. He was inviting those disciples and he's inviting us, anyone who becomes a participant in the Eucharist, he was inviting us in the Lord's Supper, he was inviting us to become exiles like himself. So I'm gonna look at a couple of books here I wanna to talk to you about. One is this book by George Steiner, which I highly recommend, Real Presences, in which uh, George Steiner, who's kind of a polymath, uh, I know that his original discipline was literary criticism, but he's written major books on translation, the problems of translation. Uh, and I'd like to come back to that in a little bit. But the thing I wanted to mention about this particular book is that he spends the, a full third of this book elaborating this concept of courtesy, of courtesy, of intellectual welcome, intellectual hospitality, artistic hospitality, in which he says, and this is very interesting, he says that um, cultural artifacts like poetry, stories, music, art, dance. These cultural artifacts are symbols, broken symbols that have welcomed us who participate by looking at the art or, or listening or singing the music or getting involved in the dance or visiting a drama and participating as, as the audience, we are being welcomed into that space, that special space of, of meaning that is shared across, get this, hundreds of years sometimes. So being dead for 500 years is no disadvantage to Shakespeare or to Rembrandt or to Johann Sebastian Bach. Their work is still speaking, still inviting us, being broken open for us to participate. And what George Steiner says is that the presence, the real presence of Bach in that cantata or that oratorio is Bach speaking, glorifying God. I mean, it's funny, every single piece of music that, that Bach wrote, he signed soli deo gloria, to God only be the glory. So great artists realize that it's not about them, that they're just a vessel through which this welcome to a kind of spiritual exile to become you know, easily identified with anybody, you know, it, I would say if I were going to summarize that whole concept, it's kind of learning deep empathy. Another book by uh, 
a less well-known book of C.S. Lewis's, which is for me, one of my most important informative texts is an experiment in criticism. And in this book, it's one of his scholarly works. It's not a popular uh, work of apologetics that Lewis is probably more famous for, or like his children's book stories or his space trilogy. But this is, this is one of his scholarly works. And it's his Lewis's th literary theory. And his concept in literary criticism, his theory of literary criticism is that it's very similar to George Steiner's. He's essentially saying in this book, there are two kinds of readers. One who comes to a text expecting to have their own desires fulfilled to confirm their, their, their already known reality, their already, the things that they already know and feel comfortable with, kind of that in Hugh of St. Victor quote, the one for whom their native land is sweet, is yet sweet, remains sweet. In other words, they're, they're, they're weakened by the fact that they really only come to a text or a work of art expecting to have their expectations fulfilled. In other words, to confirm their identity, to make them feel secure. But there's another kind of reader, according to C.S. Lewis, a reader who's willing to take the risk of letting down their guard to the text, to the image, to this work of art, this music, this poetry, and risk being changed by it. It's a little bit like this, this concept I'm trying to put forward tonight of the broken tile of welcome, the welcome into a place of exile of where your identity is no longer narrowly constructed around a nationality, for example, you know, being an American or, a, or even being a Christian or a Jew or you know, a narrow identity in which you claim an identity and you defend that identity it, you know, you can't follow Jesus and hang on to that identity. You just can't. Not even the identity of Christian. To follow Jesus, you have to be like him. You can't be like the bird who has a nest or the fox that has a hole. You have to become like the son of man who has nowhere to lay his head. Lewis is saying that that kind of reader submits to the text and lets the text work on them. They don't come to the text working on the text. They come to the text to be worked on and to let go of their controls and to be to risk being changed by that text. And I would argue, and I think Lewis is going in this direction, I would argue that's the only way you can actually read the Bible. You can't come to the Bible with your preconceptions. If you do, you'll, you'll think that your preconceptions have been confirmed, but they won't be because you'll be, you'll be getting the most superficial gleaning from that text. The only way to get what the Bible really has to offer is to open yourself up to the danger of, of that text. And there's great, great danger in that text. So here's another term I'd like to throw out there, eucatastrophe. I don't know if you've heard this, but it was coined by J.R.R. Tolkien, one of Lewis's close friends and the author of Lord of the Rings, uh, the trilogy of books that have been translated into over 50 languages at this point. Um, amazing. But he coined this term from the Greek, uh, he put together two Greek words, the word for good or wellness, and the word for destruction or catastrophe. Actually, that Greek word is catastrophe, or catastrophe, yeah, it's, it sounds just like our word, catastrophe. Um, this is the good catastrophe. And what it is for Tolkien is in a literary text, um, something terrible takes place in that story, but it ends up becoming a catalyst for good. And we can think of, if you start thinking about this, you can multiply examples of this all day long. Great stories almost always have some kind of you catastrophe. And of course, the greatest story of all is a story of the incarnation of God. And of course, the ultimate you catastrophe is the cross. Because the cross looks like a total failure. It is unquestionably the greatest catastrophe in all of human history that the only innocent man that ever lived was arrested on trumped up charges, falsely accused, beaten, unmercifully beaten and flogged and mocked, and then ultimately hung on, a, on a, an, an asphyxiation machine, which is what a cross is. That's how you die on a cross is through asphyxiation, a catastrophe. But we all know those of us who believe 
Know that the cross is the power of God for salvation. It's, it's the way to defeat death and the devil and our own sin nature. And I think it's related to this other term that we're familiar with, Eucharist, um, which means Thanksgiving in Greek, Eucharistia. Um, but it's the breaking of the bread and the spilling of the blood, the wine in the Eucharist that's related to what I'm trying to bring to you tonight. <clears throat> the last book I want to mention is Eliot's Magnum Opus, his, his ultimate confession of faith in Christ and also the last poem he ever wrote. Actually, it's four poems that were written over a number of years and then finally published in 1948, right after World War II. And it was the last poem that, that Eliot wrote after that, uh, as some biographers say, somewhat tongue in cheek, but also quite seriously, he became a happy man and he never wrote another poem because he married Valerie, uh, a woman who was good to him and brought him out of himself. He was a very, very introverted man, but Valerie made him happy and he never wrote another poem. But actually, if you read Four Quartets, you'll understand why he could say, this is my magnum opus, this is what I have to say, because it's an incredible poem. It's an epic poem. And if you read it aloud, it takes almost an hour to read it from beginning to end, the four different sections, the four, four poems. I, I lifted this one quote out of it. It's from the second of the four poems, East Coker. The wounded surgeon plies the steel that questions the distempered part. Beneath the bleeding hands we feel the sharp compassion of the healer's art. That whole section of East Coker is about Christ. I begin a project um, with drawings, many, many layers. We build up dozens of layers and then sometimes drastically edit in order to arrive at the image that seems to want to come into being, even at the expense of getting rid of months of work. Then I'll cut through wet paint to under layers to try to reveal palimpsests of what was there before. Um, I can be pretty brutal, almost unmaking the very thing I've been making.
So <clears throat> that was um, um, a little video clip that I uh, put together to help people uh, see what sometimes goes into a large commission like this for Duke University that I did when I was artist in residence there a couple of years back. Um, sometimes the client, in this case, the university, has a change of heart or something takes place that subverts the process. I mean, I'd gotten pretty far along. I'd, I'd spent over a half a year on that large mural uh, and had to completely redo it. Um, and when I got the word, I said, my response was, okay, well, let me, let me just sleep on it. And I, the next day I called them back and said, fine, I, I'm actually very much at peace with this. And I completely revised the concept uh, to include this, this idea, not just of a resurrection, but of this riven tree, a tree of life that's, that's, that's cut or riven, split. It's, it's, it actually involves um, five panels, uh, a bottom panel, which is called a predella, a top panel, which is called a, um, a, it's a tympanum kind of shape, that arch shape is called a lunette. And then there are three uh, middle panels there, a right and a left panel, and then a, a central thin strip of gold leaf gilded wood down the middle. And, and the, the symbolism here is pretty straightforward. Uh, you'd have to see the painting and be there to really get the feel of it, but it, it involves the four elements, earth, air, fire, and water. The, the medieval, in the medieval mind, the entire cosmos is made up of, of those four elements, earth, air, wind, or <coughs> I'm sorry, earth, air, um, water and fire. And they also believed in a fifth element, this quintessence, which is where we get the word quintessence, is the fifth essence or the fifth element, which I'll talk about in a moment. But first, the bottom panel, the predella. It involves the time before time, roots of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the Garden of Eden, the fall of Adam and Eve. And the element in this case is earth, which actually the Hebrew word from which we get Adam's name is earth or dirt or dust. For dust thou art and unto dust shalt thou return. There's a play on words there. Adama means dirt or earth. It's also the bottom panel of the painting. So the second uh, and third uh, panels are the two of the middle panels there. And uh, this is the time period of the cross, time of human history and the intersection of time and eternity. Uh, the horizontal and broken grid, you can see that grid sort of being destroyed by the, the branches of this tree, but the tree is split. Redemption, time between times, the cross, the tree of the cross. So it's not just the, the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in a, in a sense becomes the cross, the tree of the cross upon which God himself was willing to die on our behalf. And the elements in this case are fire and water. And you can sort of make that out, I think, in the paint and in the way the paint is applied and the color and all that. The fourth panel is actually the top panel, kind of a little surprise to go all the way to the top. And it's time future, where the grid is transfigured, transformed into pure gold and the tree becomes a sprout, like a, a little splash of green against a golden ground, a fountain of life in the new heavens and the new earth. And the element in this case is air. So we've got earth, fire, water, and air, the four elements. But this fifth element and the, and the fifth panel is this surprise. What, what is cutting the tree or what's making the tree a riven tree is the descent of God into our midst. Pure gold, the symbol of heaven, the symbol of divinity, and it's time outside of time, it's eternity. Verticality as Christ's resurrection and ascension, but also his descent into the human realm and his kenosis, his self-emptying. The descent of grace, God's presence as a divine lightning strike as it were, or sap rising in the new tree, which is the tree of life, and the element, this fifth element, this quintessence was called ether. And what the medievals believed was that this fifth element surrounds and folds and supports 
and creates the conditions under which the four elements of creation can exist. So the fifth element is Christ. That's the title of the piece, Riven Tree. And this is, a, this is when it was finally installed in the York Chapel at the uh, Duke Divinity School. So I think what I'll do now um, is end the sharing of the screen, if I can figure out how to do that, stop share. And we'll go back to, uh, we can unmute. I think what I'll do is I'll summarize here uh, to sort of tie it all together, if I may, just for a minute longer, then we can have some conversation. Uh, what I'm throwing out there is the idea that the deepest meanings that are available to us can only be shared meanings. They can only happen in, a, in an atmosphere of genuine hospitality. And it, I'm not just talking about physical hospitality, although it certainly includes inviting people to an actual table and feeding them. But it is in a sense, following Jesus and becoming like him, broken for the life of the world, where we're willing to have our work broken, to have our lives broken, our, our, our person broken open for the sake of others. Apart from that, we will only ever have partial communion with one another and partial communion with God. Um, we all know how difficult this is to become empath an empathetic person and to allow ourselves to be broken for the sake of others. No one would willingly undergo that. Jesus himself in the garden of Gethsemane says, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from my lips. Nevertheless, thy will be done. So this is not an easy thing I'm talking about here, but I'm saying that I think that at its best, the study of art, the study of the humanities, the study of the liberal arts, history, philosophy, theology, art, poetry, literature, what it does is it dislodges you from your comfort zone, from your, your native land and makes you capable of identifying or being at home anywhere. But then ultimately, if it has its perfect result, you will follow the true teacher, Jesus himself and become like him and be broken. Um, yeah, so there you go. Art is voluntary exile. Um, that was great. Thank you so much, Bruce. Um, uh, yeah, I, so I think we should kind of open up for comments, questions, conversation. Um, and I'll just kind of mute myself and let folks unmute themselves. I, I know I have to have a couple questions, but Elaine looks like you are up and ready to go. <laughs> I was so struck by your own personal story of that artwork, how you were broken open uh, in order to make this beautiful masterpiece in the end. But I was <laughs> being so human and not Christ-like, I was really um, very frustrated and upset for you that after all of that work <laughs> that you did on that other masterpiece that they asked you to completely rethink it. But, but it is a beautiful story of exactly what you're talking about. Not only that we open ourselves up to change and, and uh, the, dis the uh, uh, revelation through destruction, but uh, the artist does as well. Yeah, thank you, Elaine. Yeah, that's, uh, uh, you know, as Christian knows, my house burned down in 1997 and 25 years worth of my paintings were destroyed. Um, so that was my first introduction to <laughs> this process. Uh, but this commission was, you know, 2016. So I had plenty of time to get used to the idea that that if God wants me to do, I, I you know, I, I can say it really simply, and, and this is really true. Um, I somehow or other, I was weaned from being personally attached to my work, um, so thoroughly weaned from it that I now would be happy. And I actually, you know, during this COVID pandemic, I, you know, of course, like everyone else has, ha I've had to be isolated Eight out of the last 10 months I've spent doing carpentry. Um, happy to, if God doesn't want me to make art, I'm not gonna bother. 
<laughs> on the other hand, I, I keep getting commissions. I'm working on a commission right now um, here in the studio. And so apparently he wants me to keep doing it. Um, and I'm happy to keep doing it. But I, I, it hangs lightly on me these days. I mean, I've been painting. I figured it out the other day. I, I turned 68 a couple of days ago. And uh, I've been painting in a serious and disciplined way since I was 18. So 50 years, half a century. But you know something? I could give it up tomorrow if, if I really felt certain that that's what the Lord wanted me to do because it's his, it belongs to him. He's, he pried it out of my hands a long time ago. <laughs> can, and I, can I just like, I just want to add an amen because I remember like basically lightning struck your house. I mean, yep. obviously you're in Massachusetts, you're in Gloucester, you're on top of uh, like gr basically granite. Mm -hmm. right lightning strikes goes through the house uh you guys get out and you you survive and i remember uh because i wasn't there to watch, like to see everything the conflagration but i remember talking to um like rich and um and elsha and like basically you and meg were comforting other people who were so sad yeah, well, you were one of those people who lived in our original house. Yeah. And, and we always, our house was like a community center, remember? Yeah. <laughs> so everyone felt the loss, maybe more than Meg and I did, you know? I well, actually, honestly, I used that episode as an example in one of my sermons, just because of the, because of what it said to me about, uh, about, about how to, how to be connected, but also, um, I don't know if the right word is detached, but to, um, to live with an open hand. Yeah, li sort of live with an, a light grip. Oh. Yeah, you know, the Apostle Paul says something really interesting. I don't know if, I haven't heard anyone preach on this very much, but he, sa he talks about living as though not. You know what I'm referring to there? Um, you know, live as though, he, he's, in, he's actually encouraging the disciples to live as though they're not alive. In other words, don't, don't get, don't keep a tight grip on things because ultimately there's going to be a new heavens and a new earth or a renewed heavens and a renewed earth, but such that the things that we cling to, well, they will be pried out of our hands one, one day anyway. I mean, because we're all going to die, right? <laughs> so we can't take it with us. Um, you might as well start getting used to it now, the idea of letting go. Uh, Anyway, it's, it's a great way to live if you can do it. Um, it takes practice, but Elaine, thank you for your sweet, tender heart. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, it, it's funny. I, I also know. joke, and one last thing I'll say about that, I joke with people that uh, when curators of museums, because a lot of the times my exhibits are in museums, so curators are scurrying around with white gloves and unpacking my paintings. And, from crates and I, I, I tell them, look, don't worry about it. There's nothing you could do to my painting to hurt it that I haven't already done to it. Already. <laughs> you saw me with that electric sander and a scraper, <laughs> you know. My, my paintings come pre-ruined. <laughs> looks like, I think Mary, looks like you've unmuted. Do you have a comment or question? No, no, I'm just enjoying. <laughs> I was wondering, Bruce, if you might talk a little bit about your process. Um, you know, I, and I, this helps me to, I mean, we, I think we probably have talked about this, but I haven't, you know, lived in Boston for over 20 years. And so getting a chance to reconnect with it is, feels really refreshing to me, but just hearing you maybe reflect a little bit on your process and, and, and uh, maybe amplifying a few things that we already saw in the video, but you know, I just I the idea of 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 beauty being dangerous. You know, I've got several of your pieces of art in my house, um, at least three or four that I can think of, um, and they're not conventionally beautiful you know, but they are beautiful. Um, and so it would be interesting just to hear maybe you reflecting a little bit, you know, on your process and 
what kinds like is there are there things that guide you and maybe even talking about you know like if you interact with a with a commission for instance how do you take what someone requests but then be yourself be the artist that you are well thanks yeah there's a bunch of things in in that that question that are kind of interesting and maybe fun to explore a little bit with folks um i'll just say this i love doing commissioned work i mean when i was in my 20s and fresh out of graduate school, I got a commission and I hated it. I hated the idea of doing what someone else wanted me to do. I mean, as an artist, I wanted to do what I wanted to do. But as I've gotten older and as I've, I've become more seasoned as an artist, I've actually loved doing commissions because it's, it's dialogical, it's conversational and collaborative. I love doing, as I was, if, if we had time tonight, what I don't think we, we should go back to the slides. I have. I had another project I was going to share with you that's completely collaborative. And that's what I've been doing for a long time now. So my process involves uh, working with poets and composers and other artists. I've collaborated with a Japanese artist on a major project that went literally went around the world. Um, and with a composer, with the two of us interacted with a composer and a theologian. You might have heard of Jeremy Begbie. I don't know if you know who he is. He teaches down at Duke University, which is, which is how I got the Duke connection. Yeah. But Jer Jeremy uh, was part of our project. And- uh, that, Was that for quartets? Yeah, for, it was called Quartets. And it was with the Japanese American artist, Makoto Fujimura and um, Mako Fujimura. And then the composer, Christopher Theophanidis at Yale. Uh, and he wrote an original score and we did a series, each one of us did eight paintings, uh, four large paintings and four smaller ones. Um, but that my process is very collaborative. I love interacting with poetry and music and other art forms. Um, I don't paint from ideas. I mean, some people have this idea that artists get an idea they're inspired by and then they execute. And there are artists I know who do that. That's not how I work. Um, I don't get an idea for a painting and then go make it. I find that I my process is all about what happens. You heard me say in that video, and I really meant it, the painting seems to want to become something else. And so I do that drastic editing and sanding and scraping and over painting sometimes because the painting seems to be, have a kind of a, a voice. I know these, I'm speaking in metaphors. Um, I, could save, I could save some breath here just by telling you a story, a quick story. So you all know Lord of the Rings, right? Yes? Okay. Okay, do you know that story, J.R. Tolkien's Lord of the Rings? The very first of the stories is called Fellowship of the Ring. And there's a place in that story where the hobbits, these little creatures that he's talking about, are going on a long journey. And they're supposed to meet the wizard Gandalf at this village called Bree. And it's very early on in the story. It's, it's the first of three stories. And the hobbits have left their home, the Shire. Hobbits never leave their homes. They love home. They love food, they love drink, and they love to be left alone. But this wizard, you know, has a task for them. And so they, these two little hobbits leave their home, this comfy little place. It's a little bit like the Hugh of St. Victor quote. They leave their shire, their, their place of comfort, and they go on a journey and they get to this place called Bree, and it's not a happy place. It's dark and it's dank. And there's a tavern there, which was some rather sketchy characters. And they're supposed to meet the, the wizard Gandalf, who's going to be their guide. He never shows up. And instead, their lives are threatened by a number of forces, which I won't go into. But Tolkien was asked um, uh, once upon a time, after, after the Lord of the Rings trilogy became so famous and was translated in all these languages, and he was asked towards the end of his life, so how did you come up? I mean, how did you write this story? What, what, was it, what was your process? And Tolkien answered this way. He said, well, I had started the first of the three stories, Fellowship of the Ring, and I'd gotten the hobbits as far as the village of Bree, and Gandalf was supposed to show up, but he didn't, and I, I couldn't figure out why. He said, I had to write the story to find out. So, that is my experience of making art. I, I feel like I get to a place and I go, what happened? 
uh, it's not what I thought it was going to be. And then I have to keep painting, you know? And, and can I just ask as a sort of uh, like small follow-up, um, is that, is that what allowed you then to, to sort of go to sleep and wake up the next day and say, okay, this is an external force on a certain level telling me that this piece of art needs to be something different. Is that, is that a fair? Yeah. I mean, I had the option probably cause they, they were going to pay me the same amount of money, no matter what I wasn't, it wasn't about money. Um, they, they were very apologetic by the way. I mean, it was the Dean of the divinity school and, and they were very apologetic and they had a reason which I won't go into, but it was, it was an elaborate reason. But I, you know, I had the option of keeping the painting I was working on and just starting another painting. But I, I felt intuitively that that painting was a painting about resurrection. And it was, I don't know if you noticed in the, the sketch that I had on the screen and then the, the painting had gotten to a point where you could see these collapsing buildings and stairways and ladders kind of collapsing and this figure kind of rising up out of the ashes of this collapsing civilization, this, this city that's ruined, <clears throat> rising up out of the ruins. Um, somehow or other, now this is how an artist's brain works, this artist's brain works. This riven tree, like the trees on my property, which were literally split down the middle by lightning. I mean, that's when the lightning hit our property, it split three of the biggest trees on our property right down the middle, cooked their insides. And you could see where the roots, where the trees were because the lightning had erupted the soil like a spider web going out where the roots were. And the deepest trench that the lightning took went right into our house and it, and it lit the house. Um, when we went back and looked at those trees afterwards, we had to take them down because they were literally so compromised, but they were split down the middle, they were riven trees. When I got the call from Duke University, I was, I just said, okay, Lord, tell me, what is it you want me to do here? And it just came to me overnight, <clears throat> this image of a tree split down the middle by God's love. <laughs> the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, literally taken down by the tree of the cross, you know, the, the death sentence revoked by the splitting of that tree. It just was, it came to me, there it was. I was like, so I took up my saw and started taking the thing apart, you know? I was, I was motivated. <laughs> I know, I'm probably crazy, right? Well, but, if you were crazy, I mean, I don't think you'd be an artist. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know, art and craziness go together. Right, we, exactly. <laughs> poor old Vincent Van Gogh, right? That's right. Although, hey, so I, yeah, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say I don't want to dominate because I we have other folks here, uh, so okay. I'm going to I'm going to be silent and and uh, I want to hear some other folks. Sure. Uh, who are more than happy? I think I've muted everybody. So, can you, you unmute know, everybody? Yeah, I mean, well, people can unmute themselves. Okay. Um, There's a mysterious character named Tom Latham who's been in the here for all evening, there's no face and no sound. <laughs> yeah. Um, Bruce, have you done pieces for your own church? Or are you part of a group at your church? We, um, <clears throat> let's see. I'm, I've, we were in a church for like 25 years and I collaborated with the pastor of that church to do a cycle of very large, eight very large paintings on, on biblical- Congregational paintings. church. What's that? It was a congregational church. Yeah, congregational church. Uh, eight very large paintings with biblical themes, and it was pretty elaborate. And it was a great project. And um, but then we left. We ended up leaving that church, not out of any negative reasons. We just it was. It's a long story, which I won't go into. But we're we're at a we've been at a, another church now for about eight years, and there's a gallery there in that church, and a bunch of artists, a ton of artists in that church. Um, this whole area of Gloucester, Massachusetts and Cape Ann, where Gloucester and Manchester and Essex and Hamilton, there's just 
more artists per square inch than almost anywhere else in the country probably. So yeah, there's lots of artists in our church. Not a whole lot of professional artists. Um, trying to think if there are other reasons besides me. There's maybe one or two others who are part-time artists, uh, but mostly they're just artists, you know, like who are doing it for fun. Mm -hmm. uh, Do you have exhibits? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, are they online? You know what? I don't think so. Um, I don't run the art gallery there. I, I basically participate and they, they've asked me since I, my, one of my other jobs in life has been a curator and a, a, gal a gallerist uh, for a, a local college here. And um, so I'm, they always ask me to install the exhibits mm -hmm. because I'm the one that really knows how to do it. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but I also participate in exhibits when they have group exhibits and they want me to, I will do that, yeah. You do have, you do though have a, a professional website which, which has uh, right lots of your own. Yeah. Oh yeah, I have, I have a, I, you know, I'm a professional artist. I have a website and, you know, uh, yeah. Oh, I thought you meant the church. No, I was meaning the church. Oh, okay, yeah. No, I don't think we, I don't think we have an art gallery online for the church. That's a great idea. Do you in your church? No, and we keep saying, why don't we have our work online and. They'll put it on for a brief period of time, like we did the Stations of the Cross. Right. Um, and they had that up, you know, during that period of time. Mm -hmm. But um, no, and I, I just don't understand why. Because yes, the churches that do have galleries like Westminster in Minneapolis, I mean, that's a fabulous church. They have a curator on staff uh -huh. at the church. And um, they've got fabulous artwork and, you know, they've got a gallery. Yeah, there's a bunch of churches in this country that have really serious art galleries. In fact, I have work up in a show right now down in South Carolina at a church, St. Andrew's Anglican Church. Um, i trying to think of the name of the town. Is it Wilmington? Anyway, uh, they have a serious art gallery and they had a big opening and all that stuff. Unfortunately, it's largely online right now because of the COVID pandemic. In fact, what, what's the name of the church? Uh, St. Andrews. In? In South Carolina. Um, I'm trying to think of the name of the town. Mount Pleasant. Mount Pleasant, oh. South Carolina. Oh, Mount Pleasant. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I might go look at that online. Yeah. Actually, um, Mary, there's a resource in SIVA. You may know this. Um, there's a resource, uh, a gallery resource, mm -hmm. uh, and you can consult with them and they'll help you set up a gallery and get that going, yeah. Good, thank you. Well, um, it's great to be with you all. And, you know, I, I think probably Christian, I think people are probably tired. There's been a lot of, I, I threw a lot of stuff out there and. <laughs> yeah i can see if there's some other it looks like tom has actually unmuted himself yeah. <laughs> uh, tom did you have a comment or question or no i've been enjoying this whole thing i should i should uh, put my face up there i don't know why cindy was i was listening to it because cindy signed on but i was fascinated by what was being said so i kept i kept listening the whole time so i really enjoyed it it was <laughs> It's my birthday today. So yeah, it was a great birthday present. Happy birthday. <laughs> yeah, number 75. Yeah, number 75. <laughs> Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Hey, thanks. I wanted to talk about the, the editing piece that you mentioned um, about how you, over time, you learn to kind of self-edit yourself and you're constantly um, reworking things, which I think maybe it's different than editing, but do you ever have edits that come from an external source? Like when you're working on a commission piece or do you ever get feedback that you have to incorporate that's not just feedback that's coming from inside yourself? Yeah, well, I mean, the biggest one was the one that I shared there um, where they said you have to completely change the piece, the concept and its size down to a third the size. Um, but actually the, 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 the commission I'm working on right now uh, the person commissioning it has some pretty strong ideas about what they want. Usually, you know, with someone my age and of my uh, place in my career, 
when I get a commission, people want what I do. They, they don't want something different than what I do. So, and, and if they did, I probably would turn it down. I'd just say, you know, this probably, I'm not probably the right person for this particular commission. But um, so that's a great thing to be, you know, I've been painting, like I said, for a half a century. So people tend to, if they want to commission something, they tend to want like something I might do. But this current one I'm working on, I'll show it to you. It's, it's, I don't know if you can really see it very well, but it's a, it's a landscape. And it's a particular landscape that has sentimental value to this particular person. And it's gonna be a, a wedding anniversary gift um, for his wife. And this is a particular beach they like to go to and there's that rock formation. Um, so he, had, he chose the subject matter, it's not and, which I was really happy to do. And, um, and then he, you know, he gave some ideas about what he thought it should look like. And I changed them drastically, I mean, and then I said to him, look, you know, this painting is going in a different direction than you wanted it to go in. So we have, we have an option here. I can keep this painting as one of my own works and sell it or, and we can start over again, but this painting does not want to go in the direction that you wanted it to. <laughs> that's so and funny this, because I don't paint, but I write. And sometimes that's exactly what happens is if yeah. I'm writing with an editor and the editor is giving me feedback, I oftentimes will just incorporate that feedback. Yeah. But sometimes as you are interviewing people and the story starts to take on a life of its own, you get to a point where you're like, well, this is the story. This is what happened. And if you don't want it, then I'm just going to keep it and either keep it for myself or pitch it somewhere else. But that's a really interesting similarity. And I was thinking about when you were talking about kind of the brokenness, it's like, it's a different kind of brokenness when you are putting yourself out there as vulnerable to somebody like an editor or a publisher. Um, but there's also a lot of similarities there. So that's interesting. Well, yeah, the, 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 the nice sequel to this story though, is that after I said that, you know, I said, look, it's no pressure. I'm happy to start over again. He said, no, actually I like it the way it is. Mm. <laughs> so he wants me to keep going in the direction it's, it's going. And you know, that sometimes happens too. But I was, I was ready to let go of it and just say, hey, it's fine. I'll start over again. We've got plenty of time. It's not due until June. Um, so, yeah. I love, the, I, I love the, the give and take in the commissioning process. You know, it's actually a lot of fun for me. Wow. So, other questions or? Hmm. Is that, yeah, is that your studio behind you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It looks, it, it looks like all, all kinds of things going on. <laughs> yeah, there, there are, there's, you know, there's lots of new work in progress. Um, if I could turn this thing around and actually turn it into a, a camera, you'd be able to see better. But um, I mean, I can, oh. if you, if you're interested in any of that stuff, I can show you. Um, yeah. Do you, do you work on more than one piece at a time? I work on sometimes a dozen pieces at a time. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That the angel there, isn't that from the fire? Yeah, this, this angel behind me is wooden carved angel was done by a friend of mine who is the guy that introduced me to my wife uh, almost a half a century ago. We, we've been married for 48 years and um, that angel was carved by the guy that in, introduced me to her. It, it was made of chestnut, it was a beautiful wooden angel, and it went through our house fire and, it, and, and, and everybody said, throw it out. It was just in pieces. And I just kept the pieces for like 23 years. And this year during the COVID isolation thing, I just took it out and I, I had all the time in the world to fuss around with it and I put it back together. It's missing, as you can see, parts. Um, it hung, didn't it hung didn't it hang like over the on the fireplace yeah it hung over the fireplace um, yeah. i'll take yeah. you over and see it it's uh it's really quite fascinating so oh wow oh boy that's it oh yeah oh, and there's you know there's bits bits that are really badly damaged but you oh. know it's it's still there yeah. <laughs> Beautiful. Really neat. So. 
Uh, well, I, I, th th are there other comments or questions? I want to make sure that we're, we've got about, you know, a few minutes left here. And if, if there are other folks who want to toss a, toss a question in. Hmm. Well, you know, it's, it's been, uh, it's been a real pleasure, Christian. I, I love having a chance to connect with you again. It's nice to meet some folks from your church and, and others. Um, I, I wish you all well, and uh, I would like to maybe close this in a word of prayer. Is that okay? Sure. Absolutely. Let's pray. Our God, we are so grateful that you are present everywhere, that there are those who call on you and are gathered in your name, even on this virtual realm of computers and digital technology, you, you're not limited by time and space or by uh, anything. Nothing can separate us from you. You've promised us that, that you would be in our midst. And you have been with us this evening. And I pray that everything I said tonight that was not from you would be completely forgotten. And I pray that anything that was from you, Lord, would take root in all of us and move us closer to your purposes, which are perfect and all, always love. Um, I pray for each one here, whatever they're struggling with, whatever worry or fear or illness or a difficulty, I pray that it would be brought before you and that you would be very close to each one here and uh, that you would keep us safe from every danger of this night, seen and unseen, and give us a perfect rest. And I thank you for these sisters and these brothers and pray that you would bless them. Thank you for this night and this time together. And we pray it in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen.